بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون What's that? You hear it? Yes. That's the Adhan, the call for prayer. That means it's going to be time for prayer soon. I'm going to need to go and pray. Ooh, why do you pray? I am a Muslim. My religion is Islam, and being a Muslim means I pray five times a day. We pray at dawn time, midday, late afternoon, sunset, and at night, just before bed. We pray to God to say thank you for all the blessings he has given us. Oh, interesting. Okay, so what's Islam all about then? Well, Muslims believe that there is only one God. The name of God, in Arabic, is Allah. He is the creator of everything. God created the moon, the sun, the stars, the sky. And he created everything on earth. Me and you, the plants, the flowers, the animals. And even the tiniest of insects. God created the entire universe. There are five pillars in Islam. Every Muslim must perform these five pillars. They are belief, prayer, charity, fasting, and pilgrimage. Belief. The first pillar means to believe in God and that he is the only God and that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. The second pillar, prayer, is performed five times a day. And like I mentioned before, we pray at dawn, midday, late afternoon, sunset, and at night. That sounds like a lot of praying. Is it hard? <laughs> no, not at all. We are praying to God, and when I remember that it is God that keeps me healthy and keeps my heart beating, it makes me want to pray. The third pillar is charity, also known as zakah. Zakah literally means purification. Zakah is to give only 2.5% just once a year. That means if you have 100 pounds, you give 2.5% of this to the poor, which is only two pounds 50. If everyone in the world did this, there would be no more poor people. The fourth pillar is fasting. In Arabic, it is called Salm. Every Muslim in the world fasts in the month of Ramadan, eating once in the morning and then when the sun goes down. Fasting helps us to remember the poor and needy better. It also helps develop self-control and helps us to overcome selfishness, greed and laziness. The main reason for fasting though is to please God and become closer to him. Finally, the fifth pillar is pilgrimage, otherwise known as Hajj. Hajj is to visit the Kaaba in Mecca during the Islamic month of Zul Hijjah. Every Muslim should go for Hajj at least once in their life, if they can afford it. Everyone wears white clothes to show that we are all equal. 
And that's it. Those are the five pillars of Islam. Cool, thanks. It was very nice of you to tell me about your religion, Islam. Not a problem. You can ask me anything, anytime. But right now, I need to go for my midday prayer. Okay, see you later. Okay, bye. Would you like to come and see how I pray? Okay, sure. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. My name is Yusra Razak and I'm here in Precious Sense located on Queen General Commissioning Street for all your Ramadan and Eid supplies. For the sisters, we have abayas, niqabs, hijabs, accessories, and more. And don't think we forget the brothers. We have jalabs, taj, anything you want, just check us at Precious Sense. So I'm here with my sister. What's your name, sister? My name is Sister Amira, and we're here for the weekly Ramadan lecture series every Wednesday and Saturday from 5.30 p.m. Our first lecture in the series is called Leadership in Islam, and it gives me great honor to introduce the first Amir of the Islamic Resource Society, Brother Bilal Abdullah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salawatu wa salam ala rasulah al-kareem. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu ala muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. I send peace and blessings on Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. I begin by quoting from the Quran, Surah 33, Ayat 21. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatul hasana liman kana yarju allaha wal yawm al-akhir wa dhakkar allahu kafira. And again from Surah 3, Ayat 110. كنتم خير أمة أكرجت لناس تعملون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أحد الكتاب لكان خير لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرها ملفاسكون. In translation, it says, "You have indeed in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful pattern of conduct for anyone whose hope is in Allah and the final day." and who engages much in the remembrance of Allah. And again, you are the best community that has been raised up for mankind. You are enjoying good and forbid wrongdoing, and you believe in Allah. And if the people of the book had believed, it would have been better for them. Some of them are believers, but most of them are wrongdoers. In looking at the huge topic of leadership in Islam, I will confine myself to some key issues and take the position that the best examples of leadership are those that Allah gives us in the Quran. Therefore, I will heavily rely on quotations from the Quran because surely Allah's speech is best. Leadership can be by example that invites emulation, that is, it invites others to follow our example. And also there is leadership by the exercise of vicegerency, which means by being Allah's representative on earth and taking responsibility for ensuring that the life of this world 
follows Allah's laws. Leadership is also both individual and collective in nature. Every individual is called upon to exercise leadership in their own private and public lives. And groups or communities are also required to exercise leadership. The lives of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ibrahim alaihi salam, and the other prophets mentioned in the Quran are examples for us of how to behave. Muhammad peace be upon him was the best example of individual leadership and as his wife Aisha used to say, his character was the Quran. So we should follow him and the other exemplars that Allah has commended to us in the Quran. We read in the Quran, Surah 4, verse 125, Who can be better in religion than one who submits his whole self to Allah, does good, and follows the way of Ibrahim, the true in faith? For Allah took Ibrahim as a friend. And again in Surah 3, Ayat 84, See, we believe in Allah, and what has been revealed to us, and what was revealed to Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, and the tribes, and in the revelations given to Musa, Isa, and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one and another among them, and to Allah do we bow our will in Islam, which in Arabic is wa nahnu lahu muslimun. The Quran also gives examples of individual leadership from women by referring to the exemplary behavior of Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, may Allah be pleased with her, Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, and Hagar, the wife of Ibrahim and mother of Ismail. May Allah be pleased with them both. Among the many verses in the Quran about Maryam, we read in Surah 3, verses 42 to 43. And when the angels said, O Maryam, Indeed, Allah has chosen you and purified you and chosen you above the women of the worlds. O Maryam, be devoutly obedient to your Lord and prostrate and bow with those who bow. And again in Surah 19 verses 16 to 21, we are told, And mention in the book the story of Maryam, when she withdrew from her family to a chamber looking east and had chosen seclusion from them. Then we send to her our spirit, who assumed for her the likeness of a perfect man. She said, Indeed, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you, if you are God-fearing. He said, I am only the messenger of your Lord, that I may bestow on you a pure son. She said, How can I have a son, while no man has touched me, and I have not been unchaste? He said, Thus it will be, your Lord says, it is easy for me, and we will make him a sign to the people and a mercy from us, and it is a matter ordained. In showing us the character of Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, Allah says in Surah 66, Ayat 11, and Allah sets forth an example for those who believe. The wife of Pharaoh who said, My Lord, build for me with you a house in paradise and save me from Pharaoh and his doings, and save me from an unjust people. Regarding Hagar, who was wife to the friend of Allah, Prophet Ibrahim salam, and mother to Prophet Ismail, from whom Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is descended, Surah 14 37 says, O our Lord, I have made some of my offspring to dwell in an uncultivable valley by your sacred house. In order, O our Lord, that they may establish proper worship. So fill some hearts among men with love towards them. And O Allah, provide them with gifts so that they may give thanks. That uncultivable valley is now the city of Mecca, where the last prophet was born and to which the Muslim Umar turns in prayer. Ibrahim salam exhibited leadership of his family and the community and demonstrated obedience to Allah. Hagar showed obedience to Allah and her husband, as well as leadership and initiative in accepting being left in an uncultivable valley 
and by seeking water where she found the well of Zamzam, and otherwise caring for Ismail salam, and becoming the mother of the Arabs. Ismail salam, gave a beautiful example of submission to the will of Allah and the command of his father when Ibrahim salam, saw in his dream that he was sacrificing him. The faith, trust in Allah, and leadership of that blessed family will be commemorated for as long as people make pilgrimage to Mecca for Hajj and Umrah. The stories of the prophets are used by the Quran to teach us how to behave in different situations. For example, the story of Yusuf salam, is not just about chastity when he preferred imprisonment to unlawful sex. It also shows the leadership of his father, Yaqub, also known as Israel salam, in recognizing that his son was special and warning him about telling his brothers about his dream where he had seen the sun, moon, and planets prostrating to him. It also very importantly shows how a believer can function under the constraints of working even a high position for a disbelieving ruler when Yusuf Salam became the Pharaoh's chief minister. The story of Musa and Harun Salam in their confrontation with Pharaoh is full of examples of leadership when confronting tyranny. It also tells us about levels of leadership since Harun was Musa's wazir. Sometimes leadership of a community can be very lonely. Imagine the state of mind of Musa salam, when Allah told him to take the children of Israel and leave Egypt and warned him that they would be pursued. It meant that he was to call on his people, men, women, and children, to make this massive migration with the full knowledge that Pharaoh, who had the greatest army in the world at the time, would pursue them. Nor did Allah tell him how he would protect them. He just had to trust in Allah while dealing with a people, many of whom despaired of Allah's mercy and blamed him for leading them on their exodus from Egypt only to be slaughtered in the wilderness. The Quran and Sunnah show us the leadership of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as he went through the various stages of his prophethood. We should study his example, not just from the standpoint of imitating him in ibadah or acts of worship, but also to learn how a Muslim leader and his community should behave at different stages of their struggle, their struggle to establish a last deen from weakness and insecurity all the way up to exercising state power. Regarding the question of vicegerency or representing Allah on earth, the Quran in Surah 2, Ayat 30 says, And when Allah said to the angels, Lo, I am about to place a vicegerent in the earth. They said, Will you place therein one who will do harm therein and shed blood, while we, we hear me your praise and sanctify you? He said, Surely. I know that which you do not know. Allah refers to the exercise of vicegerency by a leader in Surah 38, Ayah 26, when he says, O Daud, O David, we did indeed make you a vicegerent on earth, so judge between men with truth, and do not follow desire that will mislead you from the path of Allah. For those who wander astray from the path of Allah is a penalty grievous because they forget the day of judgment. So we see that Allah talks about mankind as his collective representative on earth and also about individual leaders who carry out the role of vice -gerald. The community of believers, the Ummah, is supposed to be Allah's vice on earth. And more specifically, the leaders of the Muslims have to exercise personalized vice according to a just interpretation of Allah's laws. But, as the angels warned, when the believers are not exercising their duty of vicegerency, then the unrighteous spread bloodshed and oppression throughout the earth. The Muslim Ummah should lead mankind, and the Ummah should be led by those who best exemplify the qualities of leadership that Allah has shown us through the lives of Muhammad wasalam, and the other prophets. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 
that where there is no vision, the people perish. And the Quran talks about leading those who cannot make a plan for themselves. Without rightly guided leadership, the Ummah will suffer and mankind will suffer. Leadership must also be kind and patient with followers. Surah 3, 159 says, It was by the mercy of Allah that you were lenient with them. For if you had been stern and fierce of heart, they would have dispersed from wrong about you. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them and consult with them upon the conduct of affairs. And when you are resolved, then put your trust in Allah. Though Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. Finally, we should reflect on where are we leading people to. We are supposed to lead them to the straight path, to success in the life of this world and the hereafter, to gaining Allah's pleasure, and to living with dignity and security in a just and equitable society. When we individually and collectively represent Allah on earth, then we will have fulfilled the purpose of our creation. And Allah knows best. Assalamu alaikum. This is Muhammad from Muslim Mastery. And today I'm going to be sharing with you seven tips to become an outstanding leader. Tip one, take responsibility. Leadership is a responsibility that you have over yourself and others. It's a trust in front of Allah. In any situation, you can be proactive and make a positive difference for Allah's sake. Tip two, lead by example. Actions speak far louder than words, so set the example through your actions first. The Prophet ﷺ was a true role model as his actions always matched his words. Tip three, be in the service of others. Be dedicated to helping others and show a genuine interest in their lives. Rather than seeking the spotlight, Encourage others to grow and help them develop into future leaders. Tip 4. Have taqwa. Remember that you're constantly being monitored, not by a CCTV camera, but by Allah. Do your best and trust Allah with the results, because ultimately success is from Him. Tip 5. Communicate effectively. Listen to the feelings and concerns of others and really try to understand them. Consult them before making a decision that may affect them and genuinely take their opinions on board. Tip 6. Inspire others with a vision. Paint a clear picture of what you hope to achieve together. Make sure it's in the best interests of all of you and not just something that you'll benefit from. Tip 7. Act despite your fear. It's natural to feel fear, especially if you'll be the only one doing something or you're worried what other people might think of you. If you know it's the right thing to do, make dua to Allah to help you, then step up and take action. May Allah give me and you the tawfiq to implement these tips. Jazakallah khair for watching.